uh, hello again, everyone, and welcome to this year's Jacobson Family Sustainable Impact Lecture Series. My name is Christina Fialo, and I'm going to be your moderator today. A little bit about me. Um, I'm an attorney and the managing director of the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab, which is a center at USC Marshall that's educating and really empowering the next generation of social entrepreneurs and social impact leaders. I'm also a member of the Bi Mental Health Justice Coalition here in Los Angeles. And prior to joining the lab, I co-founded and directed a social enterprise in the field of immigration detention for about a decade, where I exposed substandard and dangerous medical care in our prison systems, including you know, the misuse of solitary confinement for people with mental health conditions and other subpar or really frankly non-existent medical care that contributed to the death of many immigrants in detention. So uh, today's topic on health equity is really dear to my heart. And the panelists we have here joining me are working literally in life or death situations. Now, this is the first panel discussion in our series this academic year. And I wanna take a moment to thank the Jacobson family for endowing this annual series as well as my team here at the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab, especially Michelle Duong, our operations coordinator, who's on screen here with me, and Avni Shah, our communication strategist, for helping to make today possible. I also want to give a shout out to USC's Pathways program at Keck School of Business, particularly Elizabeth Padilla, for her support in promoting this panel discussion. And if you don't know the Pathways program, you should, as it exposes youth who identify as BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and first-generation students to careers in healthcare. And that's actually a really good segue to our topic today. I'm excited to be discussing with all of you how social enterprises are creating community impact in healthcare. And I have here with me Dr. Krishna Jaffa, the CEO of Medic, Hannah Lee, an undergraduate student here at USC and the co-founder of Remedy, and Tyrone Nance, the founder and CEO of It's Bigger Than Us. So I'd like to start off today with some grounding on this topic, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the experts to answer a few questions to get the conversation going. If you as an audience member have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and Michelle will be organizing them so I can pose some of them to our panelists towards the end of the hour. So just some grounding, uh, according to the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, more than 95% of health spending in the US goes to direct medical services, while the most important drivers of health outcomes are often outside of the clinical setting. These drivers of health outcomes include food, housing, financial security, transportation, and social connectedness, just to name a few. The inequities in these drivers of health are really most pronounced in communities that already, already face challenges in accessing affordable, house, affordable care, um, including low-income households, BIPOC communities, and LGBTQ plus communities. However, social entrepreneurs like our renowned panelists are really challenging us to think outside the traditional health clinical setting and instead consider innovative solutions that target the inequities in these drivers. And now living through a global pandemic, as we all have, has already driven dramatic shifts in the healthcare industry just within the last few years, and more shifts are underway. So today we really wanna explore not just how do we ensure everyone has access to care, but also how do we ensure that communities impacted by these inequities, by these health inequity drivers, are the ones who are really leading the way. So I wanna start off with a question for Dr. Jaffa, who is a physician and epidemiologist and a public health expert with over two decades of experience building and steering global partnerships and teams towards achieving universal healthcare. So uh, Dr. Jaffa, we're so happy to have you here. Um, and as the CEO of Medic, you do a lot of work in Asia and Africa and really around the globe. Uh, can you share what you see as one of the greatest roadblocks for health workers in some of the communities around the world in which you work? Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you to, to your program for hosting and to the Jacobson family. It really is an honor to be on today's uh, panel. And Hannah, I was just thinking when we introduced ourselves before we kicked off that you've achieved more in 
in undergrad than I might have in my first 15 or 20 years or perhaps will ever achieve in, in, in the course of my life. So really humbled by my fellow panelists here and, and the work that you do. Um, uh, well, so Medic, you know, just, just very quickly by way of introduction, we are a global nonprofit that is focused on strengthening equitable access to healthcare for communities working very closely with the communities themselves with community health workers, governments, implementing partners, and so on. Um, and a really important part of how we approach our work is, is by empowering uh, with uh, the Community Health Toolkit, which is our open source global good digital platform, um, a way for these community health workers to be able to uh, deliver high quality healthcare within the communities that they serve. We're primarily focused on work in lower income and lower middle income countries. And uh, we uh, have uh, about five countries in which we directly accompany ministries of health and governments and, and, and partners and additional deployments in about between 15 and 20 countries where our partners are using the Community Health Toolkit as their open source platform. The way in which it works is at the back end, um, uh, Medic is the steward and the core contributor to the Community Health Toolkit platform. And uh, this is typically funded by, by private philanthropy and by a few other donors. And the platform in turn then becomes a glo global good that can be accessed by anyone. The front end of it, the, the site that the community health worker sees is actually an app or an SMS messaging system, a uh, uh, text messaging system that they can then use to be able to organize their daily work, to be able to target uh, outreach to, to individual households and to clients within those households, and to also refer them to care within the health system. So for example, I was in Nepal a couple of months ago, um, visiting our, our, our team in Nepal. We went out to a rural district called Sindupal Chok, which was quite badly hit in the 2015 um, earthquake. And uh, community health workers are who are oftentimes volunteers, uh, they are mostly female and they are mostly volunteers, which itself is an unpaid work and equity gender equality issue that we also address. They go out into communities and so for example, if there's a pregnant woman in a household, um, they will reach out, register that pregnancy, ensure that she has access to antenatal care, and as her delivery date approaches, make sure that she's got a referral to facility-based delivery, which we know from science has much better health outcomes for, for women who deliver at a facility. And that particular district, because they're now able to use this digital tool, um, they're using simple SMS text message. They're able to coordinate care. They're able to make these visits and they're able to actually direct their clients to where they can receive follow-up care if needed. And that's resulted in 100% um, um, within facility births in this particular district for the community health workers with whom I met a couple of months ago. That's one very sort of, you know, concrete example of where using a digital tool can help you plan your day better, can plan your routes better, can help you collect the data and feed it into the health system. So if you've distributed 10 sachets of oral rehydration salt packages for kids who have diarrhea, you can then report to your supervisor, I used up the 10 sachets in the past month, can you please replenish them? Um, and, and there's a way to track all of that information. We're also trying to see if we can sort of add to that by leveraging GIS technologies and other aspects of digital to be able to bring about efficiencies in coverage and equitable coverage of households within a given catchment area within a given population. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffa. I'm always fascinated by social entrepreneurs who are really looking at the system as a whole and not just intervening. At any point, it's good to intervene on a system that's broken or a system that was broken uh, or set up to be broken uh, for those who are most directly impacted. But um, really, you're, you're really trying to change a whole system, which is a huge undertaking and not just at a local level, but at a global level. So um, thank you for all your work. Um, and I want to turn to you, Hannah. Um, uh, we were all talking, um, as Dr. Jaffa said before the, the meeting, about how impressed we are by you. And I want to turn to you. Um, I definitely want to hear more about how you started Remedy. But first, I want to talk to you about 
um, the issue specifically that you're addressing. So the provision of housing has really been demonstrated to produce better health outcomes and significantly reduce hospitalization and emergency department utilization. So what do you think is your organization's role in addressing the issue of homelessness, particularly here in Los Angeles? Um, thanks for the question, Christina. Just as a background for anyone who doesn't know, um, Remedy is an organization that is really trying to resolve health equity um, for those experiencing homelessness. So we're developing a product um, that is temperature controlled, uh, that can be worn on your body and under your clothes, as well as a flexible fill container. That way, people experiencing homelessness aren't made a walking target because anything in an orange pill bottle is thought to have drug value. So it's frequently stolen. Um, and so literally just taking your medications as an unhoused individual makes you a walking target. Um, it's an unfortunate reality, but this is kind of kind of the context in which Remedy is working in. Um, so with that in mind, um, to address the first question um, or the second question that Christina asked about like, what do I think and like, what do my co-founders think our role is in addressing the homelessness crisis? I think it's ancillary um, to kind of like the housing first uh, method. And so for those of you who are not as familiar um, with the issue of homelessness, generally the conversations are dominated by housing and uh, providing housing in different forms, but temporary housing, permanent supportive housing, for example. Um, and so definitely do not want to kind of take away from those efforts as someone who has like a team that's also working within the space. But it's also really important to realize that there are a lot of competing factors and a lot of different barriers um, that people are experiencing homelessness face. So for example, if you want to have like a ideal, like quote unquote ideal location for where you wanna sleep and rest at night, you might have to skip going to, going to the food pantry. Um, because if you stand in line for your food, then you might get your stuff stolen. Um, you might lose your spot that you staked out for the night. Same thing with health. Um, you might not be able to make your appointments because you know there are other competing factors that are just more important um, than things like health or food and whatnot. And so our goal is to make the health aspect of it easier for those experiencing homelessness. If your medications are stolen, that might impede your daily activities. Um, it might also just you know, some people have unfortunately homelessness um, and mental health issues have like a very strong um, intersection. And so for those who have mental illnesses, they might rely on their medications to get through their daily life, just not even aside from the quality of life, just to function on a normal basis. And so what we really see here is that in order to make sure that like health is not an unhoused individual's kind of barrier um, to pursuing kind of like their other needs, we just want to create this product so they don't have to worry about the health end. Um, so that's the, that's the answer to my second question or to your second question, Christina. Um, and to the first question about like, how did Remedy get started? We were actually born out of a class at USC. So for any undergraduates um, on this webinar, I highly recommend um, you take a look at CE 486. Um, it's within the civil engineering department, but it kind of teaches you uh, like this lean startup method and how you can apply that in the lens of social impact. And so for any of you interested in kind of um, having a more structured approach on startups. I am a human bio major, pretty risk averse, um, but somehow we're here today um, with a social enterprise. I highly recommend um, you check out the class. Cannot say enough praise about it, but that's really where we started and where we found this problem by doing kind of like user interviews. And then from there, the team that kind of like remained after the class continued to develop Remedy into what it is today. Amazing. Thank you, Hannah. And also for the students who are on the call or listening in later, um, the Birmingham Social Enterprise Lab also offers a minor in social entrepreneurship. We also offer a master's of science in social entrepreneurship. So for whatever stage you're at, if you're looking for that type of support and that type of education um, that's available to you, we're always happy to talk. Um, I'm really struck by both um, Dr. Jaffa and Hannah, how you have spoken so much about community, um, which makes sense why you were brought on this panel as well as uh, the focus of this uh, panel is on the community at impact. Um, but Tyrone, I wanna um, switch to you because you are also a community organizer with over a decade of experience working in the nonprofit sector, advocating and integrating work for Skid Row missions, mental health facilities, public schools, small businesses and faith organizations. And your organization, It's Bigger Than Us, is now working to transform South LA. I'd love to hear how you define community impact in the health sector. 
Well, first off, thank you so much for inviting me to to be a part of this. I think it's an important topic. And to my fellow panelists, like I am in awe of the work you're doing, especially Hannah. I remember when I was in undergrad and just trying to figure out how to navigate some of these different lanes. Uh, it took me like a long time to bust through a, a bunch of them. So it's really exciting to see like, you know, Hannah, like you're already like involved in so much already. And that just allows us and lets us know that we are moving in a awesome direction. And so um, just quickly, like I'm a community organizer, I'm an activist, I'm also a pastor. And so I'm really involved in a lot of different lenses of how we define community. And as we're looking at social entrepreneurship and, you know, social enterprise, to me, I define that as cultural architects because you are innovative, um, you're changing the landscape of how certain things are done and you're creating this new pathway. And so the organization that I was able to found about three years ago um, is called It's Bigger Than Us. And we founded it in 2020 during the height of uh, the pandemic, as well as um, a lot of the racial injustice that was happening. And for me being on the front lines uh, out in the streets uh, with different folks in the community, I saw unity i saw love i saw this expression for one another and it was like how do we go from screaming and marching and saying unity to showing up in our underserved underrepresented communities and making that a, an effort and so having a background in volunteerism um, from skid row working at the union rescue mission for seven years and being able to do service learning trips i was like how can we take this model of outreach, uh, this model of community engagement and put it in the community. And from that, it morphed into something really, really special where you were able to see community members who were not normally privy to, you know, volunteerism or getting involved, being on the front lines of, of, of being involved, like neck and neck, you know, line in line with health providers providing resources. And what that was able to do was create this bridge um, of accessibility to different areas that most people wouldn't normally hit. And what I mean by that is you may have someone um, that um, identifies as a, as a gang member, right? They're saying, hey, I'm putting down whatever I'm doing um, to go volunteer, to go give back, to serve. And what that does is create a portal um, for that specific sector to come and get involved and to get resources. And so it's bigger than us focuses on creating pathways for communities to experience better living through health equity and community activations. And we just started off doing these massive um, outreach events and different events that were always shaped around holistic health, whether it was resources or was linkages or was services or partnering with an agency, we were able to get thousands of, of individuals to, to come and be a part of it. For example, we just had our recent back to school event at the Crenshaw Mall. No media, no no outlet, just pure grassroots effort. Um, we were able to give out uh, 5,000 fully loaded Adidas backpacks to the community, right? On the front end, you're like, that's great because you're filling this need, right? But we use that as a, as a, as a way to bring uh, the community residents to the mall so that they can go and check out the different, the health providers that were represented, which we had like 30 of them. And then we had panel discussions regarding civic engagement, you know, voter demonstration, you know, signing up for certain things, right? Then we had education, where are we, where are we at now? And then we had health providers be able to panel, you know, and table in front of over 3,800 people. And so we use this activation to bring in um, all the different ways that we can, you know, again, bring linkages, bring resources, bring services, and um, being able to do that for three years, primarily right in South LA, where I born and raised, where I grew up, uh, Crenshaw on 48th, has opened the door to a lot of areas of how we look at public safety, you know, being able to do listening sessions with the community members and do public safety where uh, individuals are saying, hey, we want more access and resource to uh, greenery. Okay, so how are we tackling environmental justice? How are we, you know, um, discussing, um, you know, different things that kind of like come up in the community. So um, it's it's been a, a really awesome um, journey over the last three years, seeing how community members take it upon themselves to lead and serve and impact their own community. And I know we keep going back to Hannah, but Hannah is a dope representation of what the work looks like 
um, after seeds have been planted and sowed. And like now Hannah's classmates and everyone else is like, wow, like look at her, like how can I do that? Well, guess what? The work we we're doing, like there's nothing special about us, right? It's just us taking the, the time to say, like, we wanna serve or we wanna figure out solutions to create equitable reasoning, right? And then taking that seed and allowing it to water. And so when I say we're cultural architects, we are literally changing the way, and we'll talk probably more about that as we go into it, but we're changing the way the healthcare system is navigating within our communities um, in, 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 uh, in a sustainable way. And so, um, yeah, that's just kind of like a little bit about me, a little bit about the org, and a little bit about the scope of work um, that um, I'm involved in and the good folks at It's Bigger Than Us is involved in too as well. Oh, thank you, Tyrone. You are a motivational speaker also, I can tell. <laughs> um, so obviously the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab is based within a business school in the USC Marshall School of Business. Um, so love to hear, and I think you kind of were already starting to talk a little bit about this, Tyrone, but are there ways in which you've seen or maybe you hope to see the business community support this work or partner with communities? Um, that's a good question. I think the the next scope of lens is uh, for us is 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 really empowering um, a lot of like the South LA leaders and the different folks that are really building up like sustainable structures. And I I like to go back and use um, a, a a motto. You know, every so blue moon there's a shift. Um, sometimes it's locally, sometimes it's nationally, right? And so. Um, the 1992 uprisings, or if you call them the riots, right? Um, out of the dust of that, sprinkled so many people that wanted to be involved and create change. And so you had organizations like um, COCO, Community Coalition, um, which was founded by uh, Representative Karen Bass, right? She, she birthed something super amazing, right? But there was also about several other organizations that were, you know, doing the work too as well. And the goal is to not do it singularly alone, but to figure out how to pour into maybe some of the other orgs and the other leaders so that you can all grow and groom together as you're impacting the community from different scopes of work, right? So in order for the work that we do to be sustainable, we have to be able to duplicate ourselves into others, to into, into, into the generations that are coming, the generations that currently exist, and the people that are putting forth their best effort. And so currently right now, we have access to a lot of resources. And so when we look at these resources, it's not looking how we as one vehicle can focus on impacting. It's looking at, okay, we've been giving this opportunity. How can we spread that to the other folks that are doing work so that everything can grow and evolve? Because we can't, like you mentioned it to the Dr. Jaffa, like she's just one person and she and she's, you know, bursting through a lot of systemic structures. And you can't do that alone. You have to be able to to pour into others, support others' work. And the best way to do that is by one, empowering the community, letting them know like, hey, like right now in our community, a lot of development is happening um, with, the, with the new you know, rail line coming in, the stadium. So a lot of displacement is currently being and in going into effect, right? And so these are people livelihoods. Not everybody's able to, <laughs> to, to make ends meet financially, but these spaces are sacred to the community. So you empower the community members um, to look at the options that they have available um, to sustain like their business, their growth, their leadership, and you work alongside them because it, it stops, it stops like, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Like if you can't duplicate into the other folks around you um, with the resources that are given to you, then the work stops. And so right now, this is an awesome period because everyone in the world right now is trying to figure out what is community engagement, what is outreach, what is uh, community impact, um, because everything is, is shifting coming out of the pandemic and people are looking for ways to govern and get involved. And I think for leaders, you have to be particularly careful with how um, you are granting or giving access to underserved, underrepresented communities because not everyone has um, the, the the right mind frame. And so you do have to, again, have to govern um, what you're doing, but you also do have to be able to like create these doors and opportunities. So it's a it's a it's a double-edged sword. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And I think what you're raising too, for me at least, is at the heart of social entrepreneurship. It's about not necessarily scaling an organization, but scaling the mission. Um, and I think that's what you're raising. And, and another kind of through line through what all three of you have been sharing is that um, many of these challenges are really intertwined. Um, and that makes me want to come back to you, Hannah. And you touched on this a little bit in your first answer, but I'd love if you could share a little bit more about how you arrived at the particular challenge or problem that Revenue is addressing um, and kind of how you began to kind of organize with students. Because I think it can be daunting to think about, oh, starting an organization organization, starting a social enterprise, but um, I think it is often about that initial problem and seeing it and then seeing, hmm, is there a better way to, to address this? So I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about your trajectory there. Mm -hmm. um, I think for anyone who's thinking of, like for any students who are thinking of social enterprises, um, the biggest thing that I've been taught um, through like the class that I mentioned earlier is that fall in love with the problem and not the solution, especially for any community based work. It's easy to slip into I think like assumptions that we come up with and we're like, oh, so based on like what I know, I know like my solution or like my vision of a solution is going to work really well because I think I know um, how this community works, how this problem works. Um, and so I want to kind of like challenge that notion a little bit by saying like fall in love with your problem. And so to kind of get to like how Remedy really came to understand our problem is that we did, I think up to now we have over um, like probably close to like 500 hours of interviews. Um, it first started with just like talking to individuals who were working within um, the space of like homelessness. And then from there, our team that initially started from um, the class that I mentioned earlier, we we're like, oh, we're all kind of like interested in like the intersection of health um, and biology and innovation. And then we kind of went down the health route talk to street medicine providers. These are individuals who are directly going to um, unhoused individuals and treating them on the streets, like where they live. Um, and from there, we came up with a bunch of different problems, like how do we keep track of patients? Um, but one problem that we consistently like validated over and over again um, was the issue of medication theft. And so the biggest thing here was like not to bias ourselves. Um, and we just came in every conversation cold. We we're like, what are some of the issues that you have? If you had a magic wand, like what would you solve? And they were talking to us about medication theft because it gets stolen. If it's in a plastic pill container, they try to put it in Ziploc baggies to like get rid of the orange pill bottle that gets lost or it's not very like safe or sanitary. Um, and so it was really just through talking to people. Like I wish there was like a more creative answer. I wish I could say like, oh, we were really like structured about our approach. It was just like the problem kind of landed in our laps because we just talked to people and just so many people validated it over and over again. Um, and so I guess like to hopefully bring a little bit more productive or like actionable side to my answer is that if you are interested um, in a problem like you're noticing or like you have a social justice issue um, that you're really passionate about or interested about, go talk to the individuals who are most affected um, by like the issue that you're passionate about, like saying like, I'm an undergraduate at USC. I think that says like a certain level degree of like privilege that I have to be able to be pursuing college education. Um, and so I don't have any lived experience of homelessness. No one on my team started um, with lived experience of homelessness. So for us, it was really important to leave our assumptions at the door and to really talk to the individuals who were, um, who are experiencing it and going through it. And so that's where we really came up kind of like with everything that I shared before, um, not my experience, not done through research because unfortunately, and as individuals aren't really like a big population that is like prime for research, there isn't a whole lot of literature out there on this issue. Um, it's just by hearing these stories um, from other people about like what their day-to-day -day look like, um, looks like that we arrived at this problem. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I think you bring up a really important point that those who are most directly impacted by these issues are the ones who uh, know the solution. Um, and it's about listening to them and empowering them to, to lead. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about um, that beginning of Remedy. Um, so I want to turn back to you, um, Dr. Jaffa, but also want to remind the audience that you can be putting your questions for the panelists in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Um, so, Dr. Jaffa, um, obviously at the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab, like I said, we're based here at the business school, and we've been talking a lot about industry and how industry can do a better job supporting proximate social entrepreneurs to create a just, equitable, and inclusive society. 
And you have such a fascinating background. Um, I'd love if you can share a little bit about your own journey into clinical medicine and how your own experience um, and your own real personal experience in life really guided you um, and has really informed your current work. Yeah, thank you so much. I just really, well, before jumping into that, want to say, you know, something that Tyrone said that really resonated was replicate and amplify and, and find ways to continue sort of, you know, magnifying that impact that comes from your proximate work, because only at scale do we start seeing the kinds of changes in a system that we want to see. And Hannah, what you described is basically what our service designers at Medic do day in, day out. They sit, they follow uh, community health workers, they understand from the community health workers what their preferences are, what their needs are, and then they factor that into the user experience and the user um, interface that that you know the app or the or the service then becomes to make sure that it's something that is built for them and with them. And really, really appreciate that you're doing that. Um, so I I would say that you know my my so I'm originally from India um, and. Uh, uh, earlier in my career, um, saw that uh, HIV patients, this is in the mid 90s when I finished medical school, was working in a large teaching hospital in, in, in New Delhi. And I was seeing end stage AIDS patients who were really being treated in inhumane ways, they were being denied blood transfusions, basic care, because there was so much misinformation and lack of understanding. And I think also a great deal of stigma and that really sort of drove me to then want to use the rest of my career and my life to keep people out of hospital. And if they did fall ill, to try and find ways to keep them healthier. Um, and so from that, I think, you know, the, a, a lot of elements of social entrepreneurship have been in, in the way that I've lived. My experiences have been around um, self-care. Um, at the individual level about empowerment and agency and voice at the individual level and how can you actually help a TB patient or an H a person living with HIV to be able to take their meds on time. Today we have a world in which you know undetectable viral loads mean that a patient living with HIV is no longer infectious. I mean that that is a mir miracle. It's, it's, it's amazing and uh, uh, looking at ways that you can then link to the human impact and, and ultimate sort of beneficial uh, health outcomes or other social justice outcomes that you're looking at uh, by linking tech or by linking sort of, you know, business to, to what those outcomes may be. So some concrete examples of how, um, in my experience, you've done it, maybe starting with the most proximate at Medic right now, uh, we are very grateful for funding from the Bayer Foundation in Germany and have a collaboration with PATH, which is another large international uh, nonprofit, to be able to develop um, mentor and ultimately link to development markets, social entrepreneurs in the digital health ecosystem space in several African countries um, to be able to sort of, you know, over time help them understand what it takes to be accompanying ministries of health to be accompanying implementing partners in these countries and essentially over time work ourselves out of a job of doing that sort of you know with these ministries the reason for doing that is because unless you invest in sticky capabilities in country um, you cannot actually see a future in which there is self-reliance um, and sustainability a very practical reason for investing and we started doing this sort of on our own a few years ago from which came the insight can we now magnify it can we amplify it is we've been able to identify about eight uh, what we call technical partners as medic these are typically software developers local social entrepreneurs with whom we've worked over time to help them be able to um, take all of our learnings from the community health toolkit and basically provide services to government or to partners they end up being much more context uh, specific and, and perhaps better representatives of the communities that we seek to serve in those countries. They end up being more cost effective for governments and because they're present in country, they take care of a lot of the um, constraints and concerns that governments or partners may have about 
providing real-time support, real-time maintenance, and then adaptation and sort of, you know, upgrades and things like that that you need in anything that is digital. And we're really excited about the direction in which this is going because you know, we think that we can actually accelerate adoption. We can scale coverage of tools that can hopefully sort of you know, reduce some of these inequities that we see in access to healthcare. Another really uh, fun example is from um, supply chain systems. It's, it's another part of, of public health that I've done quite a lot of work in. And what you see it today is a, a, a really impressive group of social entrepreneurs spread across Africa and Asia that are doing something very simple. It's inventory management for health products. And what they do is they support small retail pharmacies and drug shops in these countries to be able to stock quality assured drugs. So this may resonate with some of the work that you've been doing, Christina. And the other really cool part of this is like temperature control is also part of the equation. So Hannah would love to follow up with you because especially when you're talking about heat labile or vaccines, things like that, you need to be able to have some of those innovations as well. And what's so cool about setting up inventory management platforms that are operated by an existing private sector is that you're able to fulfill with high quality drugs and over time hopefully displace the very large spurious and substandard drug market that is out there and ends up causing a great deal of harm today. Um, if you take it up a level to the system, you have what we call in supply chain third party and fourth party logistics uh, um, suppliers. And so basically they are the transportation warehousing, things like that, and, and you're able to tap into social entrepreneurs who are working in that, in that manner to be able to provide effective, cost-effective, accountable services to the public to be able to get those drugs, those products out. And you actually saw a very strong reliance on, on those kinds of providers during the COVID pandemic. So a lot of the, the personal protective equipment, a lot of the vaccines, a lot of the other stuff that ended up getting out to remote parts of the world uh, got there because of these third and fourth party providers. And one story I love from the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo is where the beer suppliers, I think it's Heineken or someone else, right? Like you wouldn't typically equate beer with health, but they've been able to crack the nut on who these, uh, um, the, the owners of the big barges that, 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 that sail on some of the big rivers there, like they've been able to figure out sort of how that ecosystem works, the transportation ecosystem. And so they piggyback on that to be able to not just get beer out to where it needs to go, but also to get medicines out. So those are, you know, a couple of, of, of fun examples. Uh, and, um, you know, coming to, to, to temperature, like um, I think another way that Hannah, since you are working on that, heat related morbidity and mortality is going to end up becoming one of the leading causes of death among the elder, elderly and the vulnerable as climate change continues to accelerate and to be able to have some kind of indicator of you know some kind of way to read body temperature and say you're now approaching the danger mark even though it's a very narrow window of like you know opportunity for action like that's such a cool invention that probably has many other applications as well so like in all of this looking across sectors and trying to come in without sort of you know uh, any any kind of preconceived notion about this slot is bad or this slot is good, like pretty, let, try and look for what is the problem they were solving for as Hannah so, so eloquently said, try and see if that relates to how you're trying to solve a problem and try and bring in some of that innovation from the private sector to be able to apply it for social equity and justice. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm so glad that you brought up um, supply chains because I know that prior to working at Medic, you were the CEO of Precision Global Health and wrote a white paper on private sector engagement in advancing and sustaining health supply chain resiliency. Um, and our work at the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab is really at that intersection of business and social impact. Um, and I know you've done a lot of work kind of disrupting health supply chains in lower um, middle income countries. Um, so really thank you for all your work and encourage everyone to, to look more into um, the, this particular work that Dr. Krishna is talking about. Um, before I open it up for questions from the audience, I wanna turn back to uh, Tyrone. And Tyrone, we have a lot of students who are watching, um, even some high school students, I know of at least one. Um, and I'd love to ask you if, you know, if you have any advice that you would give to someone just 
kind of starting off in this field of um, health justice, health equity, um, you know, healthcare, social enterprises. Well, th thank you so much for sharing that. This is this is such an awesome um, discussion, and I hope everyone is enjoying it and taking notes. And and um, I think everyone on this panel um, is accessible, so feel free to reach out. Um, a few folks have already reached out to me on LinkedIn, and you were already kind of like talking over here. But I think the the biggest thing is no problem is too small for you to get involved and create change. Don't look at it from a whole, from like a system, like acknowledge it, but fall in love. Like Hannah would say, fall in love with that specific thing that you're doing and it will continue to unravel into something bigger and something greater. I had no idea that I was gonna be involved um, in the healthcare field the way I am. It it was all, a, and, and I was sitting there thinking about this, of like the, that space. It, from 2020, from when we first launched, we gave 10,000 toys out, partner with just grassroots organizations with the Crenshaw YMCA. You know, this is right after our formation, right after our 501c3. And we gave out 10,000 toys. Every It was grab and go because it was still during the pandemic. Individuals from the community waited in the line for like five and six hours with their families. And it was just a few toys. And um, you know, maybe um, a bag of produce. At the end of this event, I weeped, I cried, because I was like, the have and have nots has widened so much to where you have individuals on, on Christmas Eve or, or, or on Christmas spending six and five hours out of their day that they can be with their families in this line. And I'm like, who's dropping the ball? What piece is missing? I don't know what's happening, right? But that curiosity, that passion for the community led me to create this, how can I help you cards, which I launched at our food distribution, which we give out over 132,000 pounds of food um, every year from our site. But through that, we were able to ask questions. And all of those questions went right to public safety, went right to, to the healthcare. Uh, and when you look at any one of the, the intersections of, of what you're doing, you're going to find that it's the accessibility. Um, so my biggest thing is to be curious, to be engaged, ask questions, become obsessed, you know, with what you're looking at and surround yourself around people um, that are interested in the same kind of curiosity. It doesn't have to be the same lane, but just the same curiosity and find other people that are in the career field that you're that you're interested in or you may have a glimmer of it and ask them questions feel free to reach out don't be shy about it um right now i feel like this career um this industry um is wide open um and just really quickly a lot of our funding we didn't get to talk about that but a lot of our funding comes through the private sector which allows us a lot of flexibility to be creative to be innovative you know when we're like hey we're going to take a a, a service learning team to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, so that they can experience Black Wall Street and they can experience, um, you know, this happened over, you know, almost 100 years ago, 100 years ago, this is where we're at now. How can we create resources there? And the team are weeping, right? They're like, why, why don't people have accessibility the way they do in LA or Chicago, the way they should here? How can we create something, right? So people's innovative thinking was kicking in and they saw a problem. And, and so now we're able to take a bigger team next year, but that wouldn't have happened without the private funding that we get through uh, the different health providers and the different support. And so there's a there's a complete, you know, different way, like, yes, grants are awesome, go for them, you know, um, but there's a there's an untapped resource where a lot of companies are looking for minds that are problem solving around community impact. And so, again, nothing is too small. If you have a, a small idea, plant that seed and let it water because the world is waiting for you and it needs you. And so, yeah, thank you for um, this time to share. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the moderator, um, Jacob's family. Like, this is incredible. And I hope to be able to connect with some of you further. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's wonderful. And, and you bring up a really good point about um, strategic partnerships, especially early on, how important it can be to um, realizing the mission of the organization and expanding that 
that support broader in the community. Um, I have a question here. I'm going to turn to um, questions from the audience. I have a question from Libby Jacobson. Um, she says, we learned in the Masters of Science and Social Entrepreneurship program the importance of strategic partnering. Um, she's wondering how all of you are leveraging the Angelino and larger community. Um, so, for example, um, maybe a question for Remedy, are you working, what kind of homeless service providers are you working with? Um, she mentions the Downtown Women's Center that I know she's involved in, Safe Place for Youth, um, that's a great partner of the lab as well. Um, so this is open to, to anyone who wants to, to answer this question too. Um, I can start um, by answering this question because Remedy's work is intimately tied with the partners that we work with. Um, I didn't touch upon this because I didn't want to focus on just Remedy for the sake of this panel, um, but currently we are engaging in um, three pilot programs across the United States um, with three different um, healthcare or street medicine providers. I don't want to divulge um, their names because not all of them are um, known as our partners publicly, um, but they, we gave them our prototype um, to test out and they're currently gathering data to see like the efficacy um, if, and if it actually does reduce um, theft. Within Los Angeles specifically, um, we work with um, Los Angeles um, Christian Health Center, LHCHC. Uh, they uh, do a lot of outreach work within um, Skid Row. And actually literally last Friday, I was at, over at the People Concern um, doing shadowing with one of the LHCHC providers um, during her run. So uh, great question, Libby. Like we, I think for anyone involved within like social impact, you have to partner with those kind of interacting with the populations that you're working with from different angles, um, because especially with like homelessness, it's not a single faceted issue of just housing or just healthcare um, or just like food services. Um, it's like a mix between all these various partners. So Remedy's work would not be possible um, without the partners that we have um, who, it's like a two-way street uh, from both ways. We learn from each other. Thank you, Hannah. And I don't know if other folks on the panel um, want to add to what Hannah has shared. Sure, I can add perhaps more from a global perspective. So Medic is a founding member of the Community Health Impact Coalition, which is a, a worldwide coalition of organizations working to strengthen community health and also to advocate for the rights and needs of community health workers. So again, sort of, you know, really, really important and really powerful uh, platform. And, and it's all based on, on, I think, a shared understanding that, you know, you can go a short distance alone, but together we can go far. Yeah, that's so important. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. Um, I have a really great question from um, a participant, um, an anonymous attendee. Uh, this is a good question, whoever asks this, but um, it's in reference to something that you had shared, Tyrone, about media exposure, uh, but I think this is open to anyone who wants to answer. Um, when you're thinking about scaling a mission, um, how do you do that without getting lost in um, using media exposure, uh, so sorry. Um, so the question is, how do we scale the mission without getting lost in exposure of news, social media, talk shows, and at the same time dehumanizing the people we are, ser we are serving? Was that clear enough? Yeah, anybody wanna go first with this one? I'll go after you if no one else wants to, but. You, you want to go first? first? No, off to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is an awesome, 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 awesome question. Shout out to whoever wrote that. Um, it is something I think about every day. Uh, it's something that uh, me and the team think about because um, we're constantly putting like new categories all the time and it makes me nervous, you know, but I think if you know your why, right, if you know your why you started and then be comfortable saying no. Learn how to say no before you say yes um, is it going to be huge because as you start to move in the different areas, everyone's going to want to partner with you or different people are. And you may say, OK, I need to partner with everybody so I can make the most noise. And sometimes partnering with people can be counterproductive to your mission. Um, for us, one thing we uh, did from a very early age is we figured out how to crowdfund and we use the crowdfunding method to social funding method. Uh, and so just quick example, the first out the box project we did was a back to school event for Crenshaw High School, where we had two days, 
uh, and I'm organizing with the group, which would become it's bigger than us. And the, the principal said, hey, can you get some school supplies for us? You got two days before we launch. So we started a GoFundMe. And we had about 20 guys that I reached out to, and we wanted to raise $10,000. We did that in two days. Um, by the time we got it out the chat, it was like 5,000. By the time it hit the community, it got to 10, and then like it got to 12, and I cut it off because it, it, it was bothering me, right? But what I saw was the people that were sharing it we're touching different communities and different networks. I mentioned earlier about when it's bigger than us started, we had community members from a lot of different backgrounds. Some people were gang affiliated, some people were in the healthcare, some people were in faith, some people were in social justice, certain people were stay at home parents, right? But they used their circle within the community to share the information and it flooded the timeline. And we were able to get that money. We use that same thing for our events. We don't, um, I think this holiday season will be the first time we we kind of like use media stuff, but it's from through our partners, it kind of bothers me a little bit still, but we, we don't go after the big fish. We go after the community. We stay grassroots. And so if I post and share something, I can almost count on about 40 or 50 people around the community to share it. We only have 2,300 followers on Instagram. We don't, we, we utilize other means, but it's really just our Instagram and just our relationships that we that we've built to get our message across. And so we are still utilizing that. Um, that method has been effective for us. Uh, so partnership um, has been really great people power and partnership power, but understand your why. Learn how to say no early. Um, and continue building relationships. Relationships sounds simple. It sounds like the easy box, but that is truly the the best strategy you can ever do. Like build relationships. Like you see us on this panel, follow us, email us, because the same area of expertise and, and the different journey you're growing into, we're all in it. It's just intersected. It's just, just a different lens, right? And so I'm an ally. I'm gonna support um, anyone on this panel if they come to me with, with, with something. And, and I hope that you would support what I'm doing. And then that method right there is the greatest one of them all. And no one can take that away. You don't need dollars. You don't need to go on these different tangents. Like if your work is real and it's rooted in love, it's rooted in care, it's rooted in kindness, people are going to get behind it because there's a need. There's a lot of people out here. There's a, there's a lot of businesses right now, like Nike and all these other companies that are like, I would pay big money to have you be a part of our organization to create impact or just steward some kind of, you know, cultural, you know, um, engagement within our team, right? But that's you learning your why, you know, like you can cross over and go and do that, which is, there's no disrespect to it. Like if that's your goal, we need people in all the different sectors. But for me and my why, it's for me to stay rooted and connected within a soil where I grew up and all across the world. And as soon as I feel like I'm compromising that and the people above me that are holding me accountable feel like I'm compromising that, I'm gonna step away. Learn how to step away. You know, We're not supposed to be doing this laborious work forever, which is why we duplicate ourselves into other people. So stay curious, know your why, learn how to say no and build relationships. That's wonderful. Thank you, Tyrone. Yes, we definitely want to be working ourselves out of uh, our jobs. I think that is the, the goal of every founder, every social entrepreneur. Um, uh, Krishna and Hannah, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Sure, just real quick. I think, you know, like, I think everything Tyrone said resonated so beautifully. And I'm struck by how similar, like, if you can find problem that you really love and if you're truly passionate about solving for then you know it seems we we travel different roads and yet our journey seems to be interestingly unifying so I hope that I get to meet you and see your amazing work when I visit LA next um, a city that's very dear to my heart uh, but um, I guess you know when when I'm looking sort of right now you know heading up a digital health organization we're looking at it from a responsible data use standpoint. And as digital becomes more and more pervasive, there's a lot of room for misuse and abuse of information. So this goes beyond like privacy and confidentiality. This also refers to how is one's image used? How do you use, 
How do you ensure that you are getting permission uh, to use images? How do you ensure that you're going through all of the appropriate consent to be able to share something like, you know, a community health workers, GIS location, like, one could argue that shouldn't be public information, and yet we have these community health worker registries where we need to be able to locate them on a map uh, with, with a degree of precision. How do you build in the necessary uh, security and safety in, in the thinking that you're doing so that you feel that duty of care? And I think the one way that I approach it and everything I do and every time I, I go on and on in any organization I've worked with about please take permission and please seek consent before you click that that photograph you know standing with kids who are half undressed or whatever i see so much of it in my travels to to some very very poor and remote parts of the world um do unto others as you would want done to yourself and give them each the dignity no matter what the circumstances in life that you have and i think if you come from that then misuse or abuse of or dehumanization really um is checked thank you I also have one small thing, totally agree with everything that Tyrone and um, what Dr. Jaffa shared, um, but it's also about very subtle things that you might not even realize to not continue um, like an unintentional stigmatiz stigmatization of the population that they're working, that you're working with. So for example, Remedies um, logo currently is like a bright orange. Um, all of our promotional materials, whenever we do pitch decks and whatnot, we try to avoid from um, super dark, like having a very consistent dark theme, um, even for something as simple as like slide decks, because we don't want to associate kind of like subtly that negativity that is associated with homelessness by having like dark images all the time. Um, and so it's like, just these like subtle things, behaviors, the way that you might talk about the population um, when you're like talking to media, for example. Um, so it's like, always gotta, gotta check yourself, um, especially because it's like very easy to slip up into like old habits or kind of continue um, the unfortunate like, stereotypes and perceptions that we have of the populations that we're serving. Thank you so much. These are all such really important uh, answers to a very important question. Um, I can't believe that this hour is already up. This has been such a pleasure. Um, and I really wanna thank all of you, all the panelists. You were all so inspiring, not only in the work that you do, but how you share about it with those who are still learning. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to all those who are watching, all the participants. Um, I wanna let you all know that our next panel discussion in this series will be on November 16th um, at 12 p.m. California time. And the topic will be engaging communities as an ESG pillar, a look at worldwide trends. So um, I hope to see all of you there and, and thank you so much. Looking forward to staying in touch.